All right, excited. I'm, I'm sitting down with Tarina Dutton. Tarina is the founder of One Heart Global and has, I'm really excited for this interview. She just has a lot to speak into the area of economics and justice. That's the big topic that we are unpacking in the next several interviews or, or month worth of content. Uh, Tarina, it's good to see you. How's it going? Good. It's great to see you as well. And I'm excited to be here this morning with you. So yeah, just thank you for uh, taking the time to sit down and discuss uh, such an important issue. So Absolutely. Yeah. Really, really grateful that you're willing to jump on with us. I, we've done some stuff together because you're uh, one of your business spaces is here in Reading. And so we've connected over the last few years about that work. Um, you've shared your passion with us about ethically sourced products. You've shared your passion with us about economics and justice. And so I feel like, wow, this is the perfect start for the month that we're going after. Um, so let's just start there. Like talk about what you're doing business-wise, which I know leads into the whole big idea of ethically sourced products. Yeah, babe, share your passion with us. Awesome. Yeah, no, so we uh, basically, uh, I run One Heart Global and under it, uh, one element is One Heart Global Boutique, but basically it started, my husband and I are in full-time ministry and uh, there was an area, we were living in Ethiopia at the time, but there was an area called Prostitute Row. Mm. And during this time, they were actually selling young children every night to feed the family. And so our heart just broke for, you know, basically witnessing this uh, for the first time and recognizing that uh, so many times uh, children were actually being exploited or trafficked or abandoned simply because their parents had no opportunity, no jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, my, we've also adopted three times. And so one of my sons was actually left in an orphanage for about seven years. And basically with the same idea of the orphanage could feed and clothe and provide things that the family could not. And so again, what we saw was this yeah. idea that children were being abandoned or orphaned needlessly uh, simply because of the lack of job opportunity. And so um, during this time, we were working with street kids. We were working with, uh, you know, widows and uh, children's homes. Wow. And attempting to raise money for all of these things. And so what happened was, uh, you know, we realized that it wasn't really successful, but we would say, you know, give up a coffee and donate the money or give up a gift and donate the money. And, and that wasn't happening. And so we were home at Christmas time and I just sat around and we saw how much money was just spent on more stuff, you know, and at that moment, I it really, this whole thing was birthed in a prayer. I said, God, you know, I know that the problem isn't a lack of resources. Uh, the problem is, is stewardship and show me how to tap into um, this, you know, this is products and this, these gifts and redirect it into these ministries that are doing incredible things around the world in impacting lives and changing lives. And that's actually how One Heart was born. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about that a little bit. You've, you've shared with me personally, we've talked about this, like the way most of us are spending our money, are we even aware of kind of the, the paper trail or what we're resourcing by spending money on certain products? Can, can you kind of unpack that a little bit? Yeah, definitely. So uh, basically, we um, it's this idea that, you know, we all shop. And as we're shopping, we technically are either funding exploitation or we're funding freedom. Okay. And, and so uh, God really began to show me the power of our purchases that, you know, we, uh, half of all Christian global wealth is in America. Wow. And so we spend hundreds of billions of dollars a year on things like bottled water, going out to eat, you know, restaurants, remodeling our home, uh, cosmetics, pets, diet programs, things like that, hundreds of billions of dollars. Yeah. And, and how can we tap into this market, this, this incredible, um, you know, a lot of money is being spent here and yeah. basically redirected. And so um, when we begin to realize that our money and our, our shopping is actually funding one of the two, we can actually begin to shop purposely. And so, you know, for me, One Heart isn't just this cute little boutique. It's actually the idea of like transforming the marketplace and, and creating markets where we can now shop. And as we're shopping, we're literally funding the gospel being spread. We're funding the Great Commission. We're funding biblical justice. We're funding um, these, you know, 
ethically sourced um, mm -hmm. organizations and ministries worldwide. Yeah, and so on, like just talk a little bit more detailed about that. So all of the products in your stores are from, uh, yeah, just speak into that. Yeah, yeah. So basically we create a market, One Heart Global Boutique, the boutique side of this, we create a marketplace for ministries worldwide to sell their product. And so uh, we, we saw we would be in different places overseas and just see product, you know, stacked up to the ceiling and realizing, okay, that's not really doing any good here. Uh, in Uganda, where we lived, there was an area where a lot of tourists would come through and they would just shop at the different little stores. And a lot of the trinkets were still from China. And yet there were so many local ministries that made beautiful things. And I realized there, okay, we need to create a marketplace for all of these ministries to sell what their product and give the opportunity for tourists to buy it. And so we opened the first One Heart store in uh, Jinja, Uganda. And basically it's, it's all the different ministries um, and it's just a variety of product handmade either by women who've been rescued from being trafficked widows, uh, individuals in at-risk situations, et cetera. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and those products are not just in your store in Uganda, you have storefront here and you're, so you're finding essentially people that are in a restorative process, but they're, that restorative process is making products. Mm -hmm. And it, it sounds like you're connected with ministries kind of all over the world, or is it, or is it centered on a particular part of the world? Is yeah, it kind no. of, yeah, all over. It's all over the world. And yeah. so when we moved back to the States from Uganda, we actually brought the store with us. Uh, the marketplace is in America. And yeah. so I joked with my husband, my new mission field was the American church uh, because of the mandate to do justice and, and how yeah. that leads in. But uh, basically it's, it's a probably about 25 different ministries worldwide. And we just right. create that marketplace for them to sell their pieces. So, yeah. And, and I think this is a big conversation. Like when, when someone's eyes open to the reality of, okay, I want to make purchases or I want to purchase products that are ethically sourced it, you know, maybe, maybe there's a, a moment of over being overwhelmed, like, oh my God, like what, how, how would someone learn about like, okay, I'm going to make purchases that are ethically sourced. Mm -hmm. And again, this, this might be like, I don't know, eight, eight years ago or so, there was a lot of conversation around fair trade. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, share with somebody that's maybe their eyes are first opening. What would they do? Maybe they're feeling overwhelmed. I don't even know where to begin. Right. Is there like a learning process or resources you could offer? Yeah, I mean, definitely there is when we're first confronted with the reality that how we shop uh, is funding exploitation and trafficking or freedom, you know, the first step is finding places where product is sourced ethically, and that is hard to do. Yeah. And that is one of the reasons why a, a part of One Heart is actually to transform the marketplace. We need to create the marketplaces okay. where we can now shop. And, and in the meantime, it's, it's going to require a few different things. The first is, um, is the willingness to be inconvenienced. Uh, you know, when there's something that we want and we're realizing, I mean, this is the process that I've been in in the past, you know, I would say decade, but even to this day, you know, I, I know that chocolate, there's a large amount of exploitation and trafficking in chocolate. So I gave up buying mochas at, you know, I used to always buy mocha and now I don't just because I know that my money actually is, is power. It actually funds and enables a system of exploitation. Wow. So the aid willingness to be inconvenienced um, and, potentially decide I'm not going to buy something because I, I can't get it ethically. And this is a, this is a big change, right? This is hard to do. Uh, number one. Um, well, and, and I, I hate to interrupt you. No, go for it. How, how would, how would someone find out about the kind of roots of a product? Like, Oh, there it's sourced in an exploitive way or an, or an ethical way. Is there a process of, I don't know, online resources, whatever. Yeah, so there, um, I will have to give you the, I should have, I didn't even think about getting this one. I have a, um, I'll have to look it up. Um, okay. There are definitely, uh, there's a website that actually you can, um, I have an interview with a lady this week and she uh, talks about companies that, you know, places that you can buy ethically. The Freedom Business Alliance has a lot of resources. Nice. Uh, yeah, so the Freedom Business Alliance is one. Uh, there are. There are a lot of, um, this is actually where I really want to encourage the church. Yeah. 
is there is a movement in the world. Um, there's, you know, common objective and they're beginning to talk about ethical sourcing and and I often am in these meetings and I think, you know, where is the church on this? We should be on the front lines of this movement because there's no one that cares more about the exploited and the poor and the trafficked and the enslaved than God himself. Right. And so we should be the ones on the front lines, um, you know, creating these markets. And um, but when you mentioned about the how do we discover uh, what is, you know, created or produced via exploitation or not, uh, there's still a lot of gray. Um, there's some corruption even within the fair trade label and um, sure. direct sourcing. Uh, I would say a lot of times, you know, my mindset is always like, oh, I got this on sale. I'm so excited. And now I'm realizing that it's actually probably a good indication. The cheaper a product is, someone is paying for that product. Wow. And now that I'm in this, now that I'm in this, you know, environment of the marketplace and profit margins, I'm realizing that the people that are in that pay the price are the people that are creating the product for the most part. It's wow. it's a large industry built on the back of um, exploitation and trafficking, yeah. unfortunately. Well, we'll and we'll research some of those resources out too. But the Freedom Business Alliance is one, mm -hmm. and then we'll we'll find some other resources and make sure those are shared as well. You, if you find something, just send it our way. Absolutely, we'll, we'll post that on our Instagram. And yeah, yeah. yeah it's a, it's just a big topic, and I, I love how you're beginning the conversation. It's like, well, be prepared to be inconvenienced. Yeah. You, you might have to adjust the way you go about your business or or your life. Um, and I interrupted you. What else were you going to say? No, I think, well, there's this, I think there's a story that is powerful uh, in, in the sense of it gives us an idea for, you know, example, coffee, there's a lot, a lot of exploitation in the production of coffee. And so if you have, let's say two farmers, one farmer is paying his employees fair wages and is, you know, is practicing his business with integrity and justice biblical justice, uh, his bean, the, the price he has to sell his bean is going to be much higher. Uh, but what happens is, let's say we have another farmer and he knows that the buyer that comes and serves as the middleman um, says, I will pay this price for the bean. Well, the, the farmer that's doing it the right way and doing it ethically actually can't sell his bean for that price because he won't be able to sustain. He won't be able to pay his workers. Sure. So what happens is they there's a lot of uh, trafficking involved in the production of coffee and even chocolate um, or you know exploitation where the workers are not paid so that they can provide the correct, you know, the bean at the right price to the buyer. Yeah. And the way that directs that is us because if we're not willing to actually shift our mindset and how we look at the cost of coffee, for example, and like, I only want to, I'm only going to pay $8 for a bag. Well, someone is paying that price again. And so what happens is we end up enabling and rewarding and a farmer doing things unjust um, and practicing injustice as opposed to the farmer who is practicing integrity and wanting to pay his farmers and his workers well, um, he ends up not selling coffee and going out of business. And so really it, it comes down to consumers as we begin to demand and, mm. and put our money, really it's, it's about the demand really comes to where do we actually shop? Where do we put our dollars? That speaks. And so as we begin to shift and say, hey, you know, like we have a coffee in the store that is sourced from ministries worldwide, well, we know exactly what is happening on the ground in these places. And so we're funding the ministry as we're purchasing coffee anyways. Yeah, I love this. So you would call that direct sourcing or, or knowing, knowing where the product actually originated from and the process of developing that product. Absolutely. Kind of yeah. like the way an investor will like look into the look into the company they're investing in. You're you're talking about like as consumers, let's look into the sort of products we're actually purchasing, and yeah, which I think in the West that's terribly inconvenient. I I mean I don't think any of us think on that level. We just we think about our needs and our wants, and that's pretty much the the process. So you're adding a whole other element to the equation, like know what you're buying. Yeah. And, I, and I think it's incredibly responsible. I, I love it. I think, I think it's something that we should all pursue. And I love what you're saying about the church being on the forefront of this. So, so you're meant, let's talk a little bit about that, a little bit more about that. So you're saying in the, in the secular climate, there's, there's a move and a shift towards, but you're saying the church maybe is like far behind in the process or. Yeah. So what, what not, not as engaged. 
Yeah. And I think what, what makes me um, excited is that there is so much, when I think of the power, you know, of like, I like the idea of the purpose in the palace. Uh, you know, we know the story of Esther. We know the story of she's been placed in the palace. And so she's enjoying the comfort and the pleasure of the palace. And yet there's this moment when she doesn't recognize why she's there, right? He comes to her and, and I'm going to tie this in. Sure. Keep going with this. But uh, so, you know, when she's confronted with what's happening to the people outside the gate and initially her response is in action. I haven't been called to the king. And I think when we pause here, we recognize that there's this moment when she doesn't recognize the purpose in the palace, that she's actually been placed in the palace, um, not just to enjoy the comfort and pleasure, but to, um, for those outside the gate, you know? And so in the same regard, um, if we make, I think it's, I actually had to write it down just to, to not forget, but the U.S. church, you know, like I mentioned, half of all Christian global wealth is in America. And so uh, we, let's see here, 30, if we make 32,000 a year, we are in the top 1% in the world in wealth, which is incredible. Wow. And when you think about, um, of, you know, we spend an average, it's, uh, North American and European Christians spend $12.5 trillion a year on themselves and their families. Wow. Um, and yet what it would take to actually, um, basically, uh, end world hunger or provide for the most basic necessities for the star like starving people in the world um it's estimated 13 billion to provide basic nutrition um, yeah. to every person in the world um clean water all these things and so where i'm going with this is, is we begin to study not social justice um which i believe is the counterfeit of, of biblical justice mm -hmm. um but when we begin to study biblical justice we see this demographic that god cares about and it's this the the widow the poor the orphan yeah. um the sojourner and so uh when we look at our lives and we think what have we been entrusted with we have actually been given an incredible amount of resources when mm -hmm. half of the world lives on less than two dollars a day might there be a reason that God has entrusted us with so much? Might there be a purpose to the palace that we are in being in the top 1% of the world? And, and so when you connect the marketplace to this, we actually um, not only have, you know, not only is it a good idea, it's actually, we have this mandate in scripture, uh, not to oppress the poor, mm -hmm. not to exploit, not to do justice for the widow and for the fatherless. And mm -hmm. when we connect the marketplace and how we shop um, with biblical justice, I can't even think think of a more powerful way to do that. Because when you think of hundreds of billions of dollars a year that we spend actually being redirected into the hands of different ministries worldwide or kingdom businesses worldwide, can you even fathom the power that that would have in actually transforming just families and lives um, in, a, in such a powerful way? I love it. What do you, what do you say to individuals whose reaction might go beyond, you know, the, the dynamic of you're going to be inconvenienced might include an element of like, gosh, I don't know if I have enough money to spend that way. Yeah. Like, like, like budgets are tight or, or what have you. I think what you said earlier about like, if you're making 32 K a year, you're in the top 2%. Wow. 1%. That's 1%. That's crazy. Yeah. Cause, <laughs> Cause to me in America, 32 K feels like, whoa, we're barely making it. You know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, what would, what would you say to somebody whose reaction is like, I, I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can do that. It might cost me more. We might not have the budget for that. Yeah, I think, you know, A, we're living that out. Um, when my husband and I, uh, okay. when God brought us into ministry. Uh, it was back in 2008. And at that time it was, it was radical. We were in the sports world and um, we basically sold everything. We put our house on the market. We were gone. And within a few years, we were literally living by faith, just daily manna. Wow. And we've actually been walking that out for the last 12 years where um, every month we just live by faith. And so um, in our own lives, you know, one thing we've realized is there's actually a lot we don't need, you know, especially when you live overseas. I mean, we pack a bag for each of us and we're overseas for a year and you just don't really need that much. Wow. And, you know, <laughs> and, and I mean, it's true, right? Um, I wish I could pull up the stats on, on storage units. Cause I think it's like 90% of all storage units in America. I mean, you just think of how much we spend. And I think a part of it is knowing, um, it's not an easy change. 
Yeah. But the more you study justice, the more that this actually becomes something really important because yeah. um, it's not just this idea of going without on our behalf. It's actually this idea of, of who the father is and his heart for the exploited and the poor. And, and as we align our hearts with that, it, it, you know, I think I can't, I can't, how can I fund something that exploits and traffics wow. and that's so dear to his heart? Yeah. Um, I love that connection. I've, I've really never heard it put that way. That is so powerful. Like his heart is for the oppressed. Are we actually aiding the oppression of others right. in the stuff, the way we spend our money? That's, that's just a really clear correlation. I don't think anyone would think, wait, you're, that doesn't make sense. You're speaking out of left field. Right. It's very clear. Right. Right. Well, and I think it's, you know, the thing that is also really hard about it is, is that I don't even know how to say it in a, the more that God's heart, the more that we carry God's heart and the more that we connect how much he loves his children and how much he is fighting for this demographic, um, the more that we are compelled to change and not just hear it, right? And then keep going with how we live. Yeah. But the more that we realize like we have actually been entrusted with this incredible opportunity to steward the things he's given us in a way that can powerfully uh, change lives. And, and that through how we shop, we actually do make a choice in what yeah. we partake and what we empower. Are there any any resources you can think of that would help people's eyes open to this? I don't know if there's films, books. Yeah, I sent some. I sent a few resources to um, Kirsten. Great. And uh, one of the things, and I'm not, I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to self promote in any way. Um, no, no, I, that's fine. You can self promote. <laughs> I wrote a Bible study called the Rise Up Movement Bible Study, and okay. um, the entire, um, really, a part of it is, is there. It, what I like to do is there's this entire area um, in scripture about the it's called the spoil of the poor. And mm -hmm. it talks about the spoil of the poor being in our houses. Mm -hmm. And as I, and God began to highlight this idea of, of building our houses with injustice and, and the spoil of the poor being in our houses. And, and so this whole idea is he began to open my eyes to this. I realized that as I began to study biblical justice, um, there was this concept of, of our houses um, being built by exploitation and the things in our homes being built by exploitation. And, and, and so I walked through this whole process of a breaking down biblical justice. I know you have a lot of resources on biblical justice. Um, and, and so I walk through what it looks like as we begin to apply this to how we shop, because um, there's a lot that God has to say about the spoil of the poor being mm. in our homes, which says it basically means things stolen you have put in your home things stolen by from the poor. Wow. And and so he get there's oh my gosh, there's so much scripture on it that it's it's actually extremely powerful. Yeah. Um, and that but, Bible study is called Rise Up and it's written by yourself. Yeah. So it's called the okay. Rise Up Movement Bible study. I know okay. that you have a when you guys recently had a conference, I know you guys have the book on justice. Is it God Loves Justice? Yeah, Jessica Nicholas, a friend of ours, wrote that book. Yep. Yeah, and then there's another, I think it's called uh, Faith, Work, and Economics. I sent that um, as well. The Great. Freedom Business Alliance, they have some resources on economics and justice. Um, but they're, you know, in scripture. And like I said, with this study, one of the things I love is it really, it gets into what does that mean? Um, I'm trying to find, um, I don't know, time-wise, how are we doing on time? We're good, yeah. No, okay. definitely, definitely no rush. Okay. Um, there is, I don't know, do we have time to go into one of the, the complex things that helps us understand the spoil of the poor? I love it. Yeah. I think, I think that's what I'm after right now. Cause I, I think again, for those that this is a new topic, I, I just think there's going to be things that people confront in their minds that need to be confronted and need to be kind of deconstructed. And so, yeah, we definitely have time. Let's, let's go there. Okay. Awesome. Uh, well, we know in Zechariah 7, 9, I think that's one of uh, my favorite Bible verses about um, really a definition of what it, the poor of like, I'm sorry, what justice is. And it says, sure. this is what the Lord Almighty says here. I'm going to actually open it in my Bible. Yeah. Um, basically, it says, uh, administer true justice. 
and it basically goes on to say, you know, show kindness and mercy to one another. Do not mm. oppress the poor, the widow, the orphan, and the poor. Mm. And, and so here's this definition of justice that you think, wow, that's incredible. Do not oppress the, this demographic, right? Well, not to get in, because I'm not here to really discuss about, you know, the tithe and whether that's for today, but there's something I really want to point out about the tithe that ties into the biblical justice element and how yeah. that plays in with economy and how we shop. And so um, when we read in like Deuteronomy 26, 12, we see when they pay their tithes, you know, it basically says that they would give it to the Levite, the sojourner, the fatherless and the widow so that they would eat in the towns and be filled. And we read in Deuteronomy 24, 19, where he says, you know, um, basically when you reap your fields and you leave a piece behind, um, you know, do not just basically leave it. It's for the sojourner, the fatherless, the widow. And so there's this demographic that becomes clear and we could go on and on with scripture about this demographic. Um, but when, what I like to highlight here is when you think about not whether or not the tithe is for today, but what was the tithe for and, and what, and who benefited from this, this tithe and it was this demographic. And so as we begin to study the heart of God, we realize like what his heart is for is for his children. Yeah. And so, um, and so this part was so important to God that there, the Bible verse I mentioned in Isaiah one, um, where it, I talked about, um, robbing the poor. Um, there's a verse that I'm going to tie into in Deuteronomy 24. And it, and I love this part. He says this, he says, when you have removed this, when you have finished paying all the tithe of your produce in the third year, which is the year of tithing, giving it to the Levite, the sojourner, the fatherless and the widow, so they may eat in your towns and be filled. And I love this part here. He says, then you shall declare in the presence of the Lord, your God, I have removed the sacred portion out of my house. And moreover, I've given it to the Levite, the sojourner, fatherless and widow, according to all your commandments. And so that word, which is so cool, is that actual word. So here they are, they've, they've given the tithe and then they're actually declaring that I have removed the sacred portion. Mm. And the word sacred actually is the word holy. Okay. And the word holy, it's the same word used when, when God tells Moses to remove his sandals for the ground he is standing on is holy. Wow. And so here's this idea is they've removed the tithe, they've given it to this demographic, and then they've said, I've removed this holy portion. Mm. And what I love about it is when you think about why would this be considered holy? Mm. Why would this part be considered holy? And what I love is, is, is this idea of what it was designated for. You know, if God is love and if he loves his children, then he cares and fights for them. And so my heart with this tying in of justice is that justice actually is the method by which we, um, we meet the needs of this demographic, right? And it's, and as a good father, like if we think of, you know, let's say a father on earth and he's not meeting the most basic needs of his children, and he's not feeding them clothing. We actually would look at that and consider that as, as wicked, right. Or unjust, but God, who is a good father actually mm -hmm. cares so much for this demographic and for his people that he considers this portion that's designated for them as a holy, a holy thing. Mm -hmm. And so when I think about what's on the line here, our ability to do justice um, and to actually um, consider this as a holy thing is actually directly connected to the glory of God. The Bible says God is exalted in justice, that justice and righteousness is the foundation of his throne. It's which, you know, there, you could go on and on about Bible verses on justice. And so um, I just this part is so important to him. And so when he gets into this idea that you have removed, you've actually exploited the poor and the spoil of the poor is in your house. He begins to, um, I weave this in, in the Bible study about how, um, as we neglect this portion being given to whom it's, it's due, we've actually, um, we've actually technically robbed them in a sense. And I could, you know, Ezekiel 18 talks about it. There's all the old Testament prophets talk about the lack of justice and how, um, and how is the, the, 
their job as, as people of God to implement justice, to bring shalom and, and restore and wholeness to their families and communities. And so um, anyway, it just, it's, there's so much to it. I don't even know how to, to tie it all together, except that this demographic is so important to God and the mm -hmm. way that we shop actually either enables um, their prosperity and their wholeness and their freedom and the shalom um, that God intends, um, or it actually does the opposite. And so we have to take it serious as a church. I love it. This is really good. Um, yeah, I don't think any of us would question any of the thoughts you're sharing. It's very clear, obviously rooted in scripture. And I think probably what happens in our modern context is we're, we're not connecting the dots so much. We're, and, and maybe we do, we kind of compartmentalize our spirituality from our economics. And yet it like, it's a big deal. Money, money actually is at the center of righteousness or unrighteousness. Like where we see injustice or exploitation, it's usually a money dynamic. Like somebody's profiting off of someone else's backs, so to speak. Absolutely. So yeah, th this is kind of just being, this is about being smart. It's about being responsible, being mature, stopping, thinking, like looking at the paper trail of our money. Yes. Um, but I, but I love your passion. I love that you're like unpacking this, deconstructing this through a biblical lens. I don't know that I've heard a lot of people talk about money and justice through, through such a, like with such clarity and, and being so informed biblically. I love that. It's very empowering. Um, any, anything else, any other thoughts, anything that I, I think the other side of the equation to me is maybe going deeper with like, you're actually helping, you're actually helping fund people that are doing restorative works by, by highlighting their products. Is that something that you could talk to at a little bit more length? Maybe even maybe even highlighting some of the some of the people you guys are getting behind and the actual work they're doing. Yeah. So I mean, when you look at um, just the different ministries that we're a part of, you know, one of the things that's so powerful again about uh, the marketplace with this is uh, when you you know we we want to give to ministries worldwide that are doing amazing things. And so I was, for example, I was in Honduras visiting uh, Mission Lazarus, and they've built 26 uh, churches. They have five medical clinics. They have a children's home. They have all of these things, and and they're doing incredible work. And yet at the same time. Um, when they need donations basically to thrive, right? Just like every, every ministry. And what's happening though, is they began creating leather product and coffee. And so the purchase of those things are actually now funding this organization and the amazing work that they're doing. Yeah. And so, um, you know, one thing that happens is when you give money to an organization, once that money is spent, it's spent then they need more to continue sustaining and growing and building. And so the powerful thing with the, with this uh, concept that really God gave me is that when we basically give to a ministry by purchasing their product, that is like a donation. They, so when I purchase a product from mission Lazarus, I'm giving them money for their product. But what happens is now I can take a product. My first purchase from them was around $400. I can sell that product and now I actually take the profits and I turn around and order more. And so it generates this, this cycle of income where that original $400 donation turns into $20,000. Um, we supported a ministry called Eden. Um, our first purchase with them was $500. And so here we are, we give them $500, which is like a donation. We get jewelry in return or to sell. And as people buy it, we're able to turn around and order more. We've now ordered over $30,000 of product just from this original 500. And so when I think of the power of, of this, this marketplace and how we can actually multiply yeah. an original $500 donation into 30, and it continues as long as the store is open, or other stores like it, we continue to multiply that money. And so it's just a powerful way that as we shop, we're actually supporting Mission Lazarus. We're supporting Eden. We're supporting, you know, all these different ministries worldwide and not only supporting, but actually multiplying those resources. And so we can actually do so much more to fund and impact and transform lives. And those ministries grow up within the landscape of that exploitation. So they're, they're like, they're the antidote. They're the, 
the foil, they're like the different operating system of exploitation. So maybe like, I don't know, what is Eden doing? Is Eden? So, well, with that point, I'd like to highlight with yep. Mission Lazarus, as I just mentioned, uh, they have a coffee farm. So they actually pay their workers about 25% above what's considered fair trade wage. Yeah. So people walk an average of three hours, um, like those students that make the leather, they walk three hours every day just to have the opportunity to work with Mission Lazarus because Mission Lazarus has done such an incredible job in impacting the lives of their community so much that, that they're paying far above what is considered considered if you know a fair trade wage yeah i love that that so that to me is the journey like i want to discover the businesses the enterprises that produce products that are right. they're they're the juxtaposition like they're the different it's more yeah. kingdom it's fair it's just people are earning a livable wage they're potentially moving closer and closer to thriving i don't yeah. want to i don't want to spend my money on stuff that just yeah, it's exploiting individuals. They're not able to get ahead. But I do think the path forward is going to be, okay, well, wh who are those? What are those products? Who are the organizations that are doing that sort of transformation or work with people? Or, or another way, they're just doing kingdom business. Um, so you mentioned the Freedom Business Alliance as a potential starting point to make those discoveries. Mm -hmm. And they've, they've written a book called, what was the book? Well, no, so the so Freedom Business Alliance has a ton of resources of different organizations that create, you know, whether they're, um, you know, home goods, yep. uh, whether they are um, coffee and tea and they sure. write a lot of resources, they blog, it's a faith based organization. And, and so yep. they, it's a great place to start for resources. Great. Faith, work, and economics also has uh, resources on just economics and our faith and how much, you know, God, Jesus spoke a lot about money. The word talks a lot about money and technically it's just a tool, right? It's a resource yeah. to fund the work of the great commission, but that's a great place for resources. Obviously our, I mean, I'm not, again, our store, we partner with about 25 organizations um, in the store, but there are so many more that I'm aware of, um, whether yeah. it's home goods, et cetera. And then the final piece is, is we actually need, if there are people that are in business, um, I know, I know an individual who actually owns a man, like bought a manufacturing, uh, not plant, but a, a, a place in India where they manufacture. And so I, what I see is actually the church beginning to get on the front lines of, you know, Walmart and Target are going to do this as the trend shifts in this direction. It's already shifting. As you discussed before, even 10 years ago, the talk of, you know, or eight years, this talk of direct trade or fair trade. Yeah. Um, but I think. I want to challenge the church too for those in business or that have resources, you know, is let's like, we need to actually create these opportunities to, you know, our apparel. And that's largely, largely, there's so much exploitation in apparel. Well, where do we shop? It's hard to find. Yeah. So, contact me. I can point you to in some places, uh, Freedom Business Alliance um, has a directory of sorts that you can find things there. Um, and then let's, let's actually begin to take over this, uh, this get on the front lines of it and actually have the ability to direct where these funds go as, as we begin to buy the manufacturing places and support ministries on the ground that are actually transforming lives and communities through ethical sourcing of products. So, yeah, you're, you're a great resource for this. And I think, yeah, I don't think you're like, whatever, promoting your stuff by talking about your boutique, the store that you own. I think the store that you own is a, like, it's a great starting point for some people that maybe have never thought about this stuff and you know, where those products are coming from and you know, the stories behind the products. Uh, who's the author of faith, work and economics, the book. Do you um, know? No. So that's not a book. It's actually an organization. It's an organization. Um, okay. Yeah. I just sent it to, let me see here. Um, I sent it to Chris. Yes, that's sorry. great. That's, okay, that's enough. It. That's enough. That's perfect. Okay. And then how would, how would people find you if they're like, oh, well, I want to take her up on this and learn, learn about some things that I don't know that she does know. Is it just as simple as going down to the boutique here in Reading, One Heart Global Boutique or? Yeah, absolutely. Either. I mean, you can reach out uh, to me via email. Um, I don't mind. I can either share it right now or give it, send it to you and you can post it. What works? Yeah, do, do both. Tell us what it is and then we'll also post it. Yeah, so my email is Tarina at oneheart.global. 
Okay. And uh, you can reach out that way. You can come to the store and check it out. And again, like I said, this is just a limited space here, yeah. but I, I am aware of a lot of other organizations as well uh, that create product in a different, in different areas, whether it's tea, chocolate, coffee, home goods, et cetera, and yep. point you in that direction. That's great. And is that, I mean, that sounds like an amazing resource in and of itself, like some sort of flyer or whatever that you probably have in your store that people can leave with. And where's your store located? I keep saying it's in Reading, but where where is it? So people. So know. we're right down on Tehama and Market Street. Okay. So we're right across the street from Crown Camera. Yep. And uh, Sandwichery is to our right, the little sandwich shop. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so we're right right here downtown. Yeah, I love it, Tarina. Thank you. Thanks for what you're doing. Thanks for sharing all this knowledge. Uh, yeah. Again, I think a lot of us. This is a brand new topic. We're like, whoa, whoa what would I even do? Where would I start? So I think we've shared enough nuggets for people to get going on the journey. And obviously, like, go spend some time down at One Heart Global Boutique, their store here in downtown Reading. Uh, do you guys have a website that people can look at as well? Uh, yeah, we do. So it's okay. um, oneheart.global. So www.oneheart.global. Perfect. Yeah, thank you for what you're doing. I, I think this thank is you. really critical. We'll share some of these resources, too, going forward. And yeah, I just appreciate you, your work, your life, your family. Thank you guys for being present and showing up and shining. This, I mean, this is what we're all about. It's like, hey, you have a passion, go for it, right? Don't hold back. You guys are definitely not holding back. Yeah, um, awesome. yeah and thanks for your influence in both in our town, but the, yeah, the broader body of Christ. I, I do think there's a call for people to be getting involved in this space. Uh, anything else as we're as we're finishing it up? What's that? I said all of us shop anyways. So there you go. <laughs> it's, not, it's not optional. We we actually shop, so now we can we can think about you know making the most of those resources. So I love it. Anything else as we're finishing up? Just last words or something I haven't directed us towards that you wanted to share? No, I just thank you for taking the time. And I, again, I want to point to the work that you're doing. Uh, it's exciting, you know, the Justice Collective. Um, I really believe that God is restoring biblical justice in this hour. Mm. And, you know, the world is crying out for justice. And I know, I believe that there's a counterfeit movement that's happening right now. But as we, as the church begin to rise up and, and restore biblical justice to know and yeah. understand what that is and how we live that out. I just, I want to encourage you to obviously keep going and it's exciting to be a part of it and everyone watching just, um, it's time for us to rise up and to, um, to just give God glory through restoring biblical justice. And he's doing that in this season. So. And it, it's, it's a little off subject, but I'd love to hear you say, like, when you say there's a counterfeit movement, like what, what's in your mind there? What are you, what are you suggesting? And well, so my, it was actually during this time, um, I, so there was a lady who stayed with us in Uganda and she said, you know, I am, I believe in socialism. And it was like the spirit of God rose up in me. And I actually said, um, you know, socialism is actually the counterfeit of biblical um, justice and the acts for church. And it's taking tenets of truth, but removing Christ and putting the government in its place. Wow. And, and, and God had me studying it for so long and I didn't know how it tied into biblical justice and the economy and what I felt God say um, last, it was actually during the riots in 2020. And I was just like, God, what do we do? The world is crying out for justice. Yeah. What do we do? And he just so clearly said, you're the movement. The church is the movement. As we restore biblical justice on this earth, the world is going to get justice and they're going to turn to the government for the answers if the church does not begin to genuinely know what biblical justice is live it out in their communities and it acts for a model that was it was freedom based it was you know radical generosity that there was actually no need not because it was taken away and redistributed by a wicked government yeah. um, but because the church was stewarding it and so laid out in love with god and with his people that they were radically generous and meeting the needs of the community and so when god showed me this he actually showed me that this movement right now is the counterfeit because the world wants justice yeah. and what i felt he said was like they're gonna get it but are they gonna get my justice yeah. this move of justice this reform like this transformational shalom wholeness like god's 
kingdom kind of justice, right? His kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, or are they going to get the counterfeit, which is what this movement is that leads to bondage and slavery. So, yeah. Wow. That, those are powerful thoughts. And, and I appreciate you. Yeah. Your encouragement to us and what we're a part of and pursuing. And, but again, like to me, the key word is collective. Like we're all doing this. This, this isn't one, one group or one organization. I think we all, we all have a part to play, but um, really good thoughts. Tarina, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. So really good. Really good to spend time with you. Thanks for what you're up to. And now we're with you. It, whatever, whatever that looks like, we're with you. Keep, keep up the good work and awesome. we will, we'll get these resources in front of our, on our platform. So again, the hope with these conversations isn't, isn't information. It's more of an impartation, education, learning, eyes opening. And okay, what next? Like, what kind of steps can I take as a personal follower of Jesus? And that would probably be the charge I would be wanting to land with on this interview is like, okay, we're all making purchases. Do we know kind of the, are we connecting the dots between ethically sourced products? And yeah, I'm not going to restate everything Tarina said, but this is a big deal. Let's, let's take this seriously. I feel like I've got some learning to do. So thanks for. I do as well. well. Yeah. <laughs> We're always learning. Yeah. And, um, but, but happy to engage in the process. I, I think all of us want to like feel good about our lives and the way we're spending our time and using our resources. Right. Absolutely. Cool. Absolutely. All right. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to finish it. Thank you again, Tarina. We're going to say goodbye with that. Have Absolutely. a really good day. Good to see you. You too. Thanks so much. Thank you. Adios. Bye.